Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories number 18, for mid-March 2023. Courage for the Deed, Grace for the Doing, The Shipley Sisters, and Educating Girls. Welcome to the 18th episode of Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, a historic and active cemetery in Bala Kinwood, Pennsylvania. I am Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide and volunteer podcaster for Laurel Hill East and Laurel Hill West. Laurel Hill West opened in 1869 across the river from its sister cemetery, Laurel Hill East in Philadelphia. It's more than twice as big as Laurel Hill East. It has a totally different feel and a strikingly different population. And like Laurel Hill East, it is open 365 days a year, now from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There's plenty of parking at the business office just off Belmont Avenue or at the conservatory in Bell Tower. If you enter on Belmont, you're going to follow the road past the second gate It has a white line in the middle of it. The road has a white line in it. That'll take you back to the conservatory. Another possibility, just duck in while you're walking the Kinwood Trail. Public transportation's a little tougher. Take the R6 to Maniunk or a bus to the Wissahickon Transportation Center on Ridge Avenue. Then cross the Pencoid Pedestrian Bridge, go right over the Schuylkill River, walk up Riders Ferry Road, the entrance across from the Pet Cemetery. The 18th episode of Biographical Bites from Bala is from mid-March 2023. Three Quaker sisters, Hannah, Elizabeth, and Catherine Shipley, decided they wanted to start a school for girls. Not another finishing school where girls learn to cook and crochet and behave in society, but a rigorous academic school specifically to train girls in languages and the sciences so they could get into Bryn Mawr and other colleges that were springing up for women in the late 19th century. You'll learn about the evolution of girls' education from before the founding of the country and some special personalities that populated the Shipley School for its first 75 years. Welcome to Courage for the Deed, Grace for the Doing. The Shipley Sisters and Educating Girls. I have talked about three Philadelphia area Quaker founded colleges in prior podcasts. Haverford College, founded in 1833, is an institution of higher learning for men. That was in All Bones Considered number 41, Harry Cecil Kitty, three more drinkers' siblings to know. Swarthmore College, co-educational, founded in 1864. You can hear more about that in Biographical Bites from Bala number 6, Hannah Clothier Hull, A Life for Peace. The latecomer to the Philadelphia Quaker College trio was Bryn Mawr a female-only Seven Sisters College founded in 1885. I talked about it at length in All Bones Considered number 24, Four Remarkable Women You Should Know. I told you the story of Catherine Elizabeth McBride, who served as the college's president for 28 years. 
The idea of education solely for girls was not new to Philadelphia. In the 18th century, most wealthy parents were willing to invest in education for their sons because it increased their chances of establishing a profitable career. But in general, the purpose of girls' education in colonial America was to become skilled at household duties in order to find a suitable husband. A woman who was well-educated in academic subjects was thought unusual and not good marriage material. Education in colonial America was based on European traditions. Wealthy girls might be taught by a governess or sent to a convent school to learn the basics of reading and writing. Oddly, some girls were taught only reading so they could study the scriptures and pass on their wisdom to their children, but when given something to sign, they merely made an X. Most middle-class families could only afford to educate their sons. In lower-class families, neither the boys nor the girls were educated. As America grew, private tutors were slowly replaced by town schools. In colonial America, both girls and boys attended dame schools, equivalent to today's kindergarten. A local woman would take in several children and teach them their numbers and ABCs, as well as some other basic skills like the reading and writing. Boys attained these basic skills so they could enroll in a town school. These became more available after the colonies united in 1776, and the philosophy of Republican motherhood was introduced. Republican motherhood is an 18th century term for an attitude toward women's roles in the emerging United States. It's centered on a belief that patriots' daughters should be raised to uphold the ideals of republicanism so they could pass these values to the next generation. The Republican mother was considered a custodian of civic virtue responsible for upholding the morality of her husband and children. Historians tell us that Republican motherhood is hard to categorize in the history of feminism. I mean, on the one hand, it reinforced the idea of a domestic woman's sphere separate from the public world of men. But on the other hand, it encouraged the education of women and invested their traditional sphere with a dignity and importance that had been missing from previous conceptions of women's work. In addition to reading, girls were taught home skills, such as sewing, cooking, knitting. But only a few towns allowed girls into the town schools. It wasn't really until the end of the 18th century that girls were permitted to attend town schools, and even then they were usually taught separately from the boys. One key event in the history of girls' education was the opening of the Young Ladies' Academy in Philadelphia, in 1787, the first all-female academy in America. It was located on Cherry Street between 3rd and 4th, just a few blocks from where the Constitutional Convention was meeting. The Young Ladies Academy was established by John Poor. It was sponsored and supervised by many of Philadelphia's male religious and political leaders. One of its biggest proponents was Dr. Benjamin Rush, he believed in education for women, but mostly for the purpose of passing on their knowledge to their young sons. The Young Ladies Academy offered a broad curriculum, reading, writing, English grammar, mathematics, geography, rhetoric, composition, chemistry, natural philosophy, all of course being taught by male teachers. Less than a year after it opened, more than 100 girls had enrolled at the academy. It also gave young women a visible civic role by holding annual public examinations for the graduates. These events were well attended by prominent Philadelphians and featured orations by students, prizes for academic merit, and sermons by male visitors. It was at this first public ceremony that Dr. Rush gave his famed lecture, Thoughts Upon Female Education. Among other things, Rush insisted on proper penmanship for girls. I know a few things more rude or illiberal 
than to obtrude a letter upon a person of rank or business which cannot be easily read. But even in the late 1700s, some academy students were challenging limitations imposed by men. In her 1794 salutary speech to the Young Ladies Academy, Priscilla Mason argued, Our high and mighty lords, thanks to their arbitrary constitutions, have denied us the means of knowledge, and then reproached us for the want of it. Being the stronger party, they early seized the scepter and the sword, and with these they gave laws to society. They denied women the advantage of a liberal education, and forbade them to exercise their talents on those great occasions which would serve to improve them. The female seminary movement began around 1815. Their goal was to offer women an education equal to that of men by holding their pupils to the same high standards. But these female seminaries were limited to young ladies from families who could afford to pay tuition, and they still emphasized ladylike accomplishments rather than academic subjects. Some of these seminaries later grew into colleges, like Mount Holyoke, while others became private high schools. But none were true women's colleges until many years later. Republican education prepared girls for their future role as wives and mothers by teaching religion, singing, dancing, and literature. Seminaries generally educated women for the only socially acceptable occupation, teaching. And only unmarried women could be teachers. Many early women's colleges began as female seminaries and were responsible for producing an important core of educators. In 1833, Oberlin College became the first co-educational college in the United States and the first college in the United States to regularly admit African-American students beginning in 1835. In 1837, Mount Holyoke Female Seminary opened its South Hadley, Massachusetts doors to female students. Mount Holyoke did introduce two major innovations in women's education, rigorous academic entrance exams and a demanding curriculum. There was not a single class in drawing or needlework. Women's Medical College of Philadelphia was founded in 1850. I will give it a podcast of its own sometime in the near future. Now we know the ascent of Princess Alexandrina Victoria of Kent to the throne of England in 1837 was the beginning of the Victorian era. Victorians saw education as a means of both social control and individual betterment. For boys, the lower classes were taught primarily to know their place and were given only the rudiments of literacy. Among the middle classes, moral behavior and adherence to group norms were enforced along with scholarship and competitive exams. But for girls, social control was the predominant theme of Victorian education for all social classes. Social class in Victorian societies was defined through a subtle combination of occupation, income, and the values of males. Females were given the class of their fathers, if they were unmarried, and of their husbands once they were married. Unmarried, separated, or divorced women and widows were a special problem and they kept the class of their former male relative until they acquired a status of their own. In 1848, four years before Boston opened its first public school for girls, the city of Philadelphia built what it called the Girls' Normal School at the intersection of Chester Street and Maple Street. Its location was long ago paved over. It's now a parking lot at 8th and Arch Street. Normal schools educated future teachers to work in primary and secondary education. It was the first secondary public school for girls in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It opened in February, and by June it had enrolled 149 students. In 1859, the name of the school was changed to the more familiar-sounding Girls High School of Philadelphia. 
As one of the few public educational institutions for women, enrollment grew until in the centennial year of 1876, a new building was erected at 17th and Spring Garden Streets. This new building had 40 classrooms, terraced lecture halls, and an auditorium with a capacity of 1,200 people. That's almost double the school student body of 640 at the time. In fact, this building was so large that in Philadelphia, only Girard College and the University of Pennsylvania surpassed it in terms of land area used. In 1933, Girls High again underwent another expansion, which it also outgrew. Girls High School moved to its current location at Broad and Olney in 1958, and the old building on Spring Garden Street became the Julia R. Masterman School. Julia R. Masterman is interred in the Moreland section of Laurel Hill West. Despite the presence of public high schools for girls, private schools still thrived. After the Civil War, women's organizations in the Catholic Church opened schools for girls in the Philadelphia region. The Academy of Notre Dame de Namur in 1856, Mount St. Joseph Academy in 1858, and Gwynedd Mercy Academy in 1861. I have talked briefly about the Agnes Irwin School, founded in 1869 in prior podcasts. But it wasn't until the opening of Bryn Mawr College in 1885 that schools were developed with the specific intent of preparing girls for the rigors of a college that prized superb teaching and research from the day that it opened. In 1888, Miss Florence Baldwin and her two sisters opened a school at their mother's home at Montgomery and Morris in Bryn Mawr, only blocks from the college campus. Nearby, the Philadelphia architect Frank Furness designed a Bryn Mawr Hotel just off Montgomery Avenue, built between 1890 and 91. In 1896, the Baldwin School rented the hotel during the winter months to conduct their classes there. Eventually, the school took over the hotel, which is full of curved porches, conical spires, muscular red brick, field stone, In other words, it's instantly recognized as a Frank Furness building. The Baldwin School, no relation to Matthias Baldwin, by the way, the man of locomotive fame, had the specific intent of funneling prepared girls into Bryn Mawr College. Well, in October 1894, the Baldwin sisters got competition when three other sisters, Hannah Taylor Shipley, age 44, Elizabeth Anthony Shipley, age 35, and Catherine, with a K and two A's, Catherine Morris Shipley, age 26, took a single pupil into a house they had rented in Bryn Mawr and undertook to prepare her for the rigorous entrance examinations of Bryn Mawr College. Within weeks, five more girls, all referred by the college, had come to live at the Mrs. Shipley's Bryn Mawr School. That's Mrs. M-I-S-S-E-S. There were nine faculty members, several from Bryn Mawr College, for the six girls. Their father, Murray Shipley, 1831-1899, was born in New York and brought up in Cincinnati. He was a man of firm religious faith and a stern compassion. His gravestone in Cincinnati calls him Reverend Shipley. His great-great-grandfather was Stephen Hopkins, a signer of the Declaration of Independence from Rhode Island. Murray made his fortune in the wholesale dry goods business. He married at 20, and with his wife, Hannah Davis Shipley, had nine children. In 1864, he founded the Children's Home of Cincinnati. Hannah was his firstborn. She was 17 when her mother and the ninth baby died in childbirth, in 1871, and Hannah became mother to the rest of the children. Murray took his large family frequently to Europe, and he saw to it that all his children had the best possible education. Hannah studied in Philadelphia at a school run by her cousin, Catherine with a C, Shipley, who in 1875 became Murray's second wife. Elizabeth attended Wesleyan College in Cincinnati. 
And in 1885, Catherine, with a K, the youngest Shipley sister, entered the first class at Bryn Mawr College. After Catherine's graduation in 1890, there was a year delay because of a crippling fall, which actually forced her to complete her schooling on her back. Murray took the girls to Europe for further study in Germany, France, and England. The lives of Hannah, Elizabeth, and Catherine were profoundly influenced by their father's personality. As a good Quaker, he disdained societal life, and he guided his daughters toward the intellectual and artistic rather than the social. His pride in them was not the only reason for their superior education. It also prevented their marrying, since he believed no man was worthy of them. Only one of his four daughters, Mary, dared oppose him, and at 18, she married Charles Howland. In 1890, Murray Shipley's business failed, and he spent several years paying off his creditors. It was about this time, and in part because of their father's misfortune, that the unmarried sisters began to plan a school. However, if Murray Shipley's character and career were instrumental in the genesis of Shipley's school, Bryn Mawr College was no less instrumental. Hannah had been for several years a mistress of residence at the college. In other words, she was a house mother. Catherine had graduated from Bryn Mawr with distinction. And Bryn Mawr had instilled in both the conviction that learning for girls or young women should not stop at 17. The first catalog for the Shipley School is simple and to the point. The Mrs. Shipley's Bryn Mawr School. Miss Shipley was a mistress of one of the halls of residence of Bryn Mawr College and has had large experience in the care of young girls. Miss Elizabeth Anthony Shipley has specialized in German, residing in Leipzig and attending the lectures of the university. Miss Catherine Morris Shipley, Bryn Mawr College, 1885-1890, AB 1890, holder of the Bryn Mawr European Fellowship, 1890-91, University of Leipzig, 1890-91, Collège de France and the Sorbonne, 1891 92. Newnham College, Cambridge, May term, 1892. The special design of the school is to prepare girls for Bryn Mawr College. Careful attention will be given to French and German. Day pupils from Philadelphia and the neighborhood will be received. A luncheon will be provided if desired. Tuition with board, $500 to $800 a year. The price difference was whether you wanted a private room, whether you shared it with one person or two people, where it was located in the dormitory, etc. Day pupils, $100 to $150. I know you're curious. For the school year 2023-24, pre-K tuition at Baldwin is $23,500. Middle school is $38,000. High school $42,200, and there is no longer boarding at the school. Those costs are just tuition. The main object of the Mrs. Shipley and their associated instructors will be the careful direction of the work of the pupil with a view to the best economy of her effort and an intimate oversight of her individual development. It will be their aim to fit her to enter college with a mind trained to the habits of scientific study and a character qualified in as far as possible to receive the highest culture. Hannah was the undisputed master of the school, described by students as dignified and awesome. Elizabeth was livelier. The girls cheered when she went streaking down the hockey field in her green gym suit dribbling the ball at the height of the faculty school game. Elizabeth was also the business manager whose shrewd financial sense earned her the admiration of Philadelphia bankers. Catherine, the most highly educated of the three, stayed over in the background and her bad health continually plagued her. 
uh, with them from nearly the beginning. It was an intimate friend of Hannah's, Miss Rose Chamberlain, an English woman who graduated the first class of Newnham College, Cambridge, 1886. She lived at the school from 1895 until her death in 1916. The school college of 1895 showed all the faculty had attended Bryn Mawr, Newnham College, Cambridge, or the Sorbonne. Their courses of study included German, French, mathematics, history, English, Greek, Latin, physiology, vocal and instrumental music, including banjo and violin, and history of art. Soon added to this rigorous high school program were electives in music appreciation, political economy, civil government, and current events. Freedom of expression was emphasized from the very beginning. Shipley advertised itself as a home school, not a school away from home. The girls participated in the life of the community. They took trips to the city for concerts and plays. Bryn Mawr train station was just a few minutes stroll. They walked and rode horses. They sledded. They skated. All with the freedom of girls living with their parents. A few traditions were established early in the life of the school. In 1901-02, the only prize given at the end of the year was the leather milk bottle top stamped Numquan Non Paratus, never unprepared. It was given as a reward for promptness to breakfast and classes. By 1905, the boar's head ceremony at the Christmas dinner was established as well as the old girls' play, later to become the fall play. There was a spring dance in May to which, quote, every girl may invite three friends for whose enjoyment throughout the evening she is responsible. The Shipleys soon opened a lower school for younger girls to accompany the upper school. May Day with the Maypole dance climaxed the first year of the primary department when it opened in 1901-02. The Shipley Seal first appeared on an illustrated booklet in 1905-06. Early attempts at a school motto include, Be strong in essentials and gentle about it. In essentials strong, gentle in manner. And strong in principle, teachable in spirit. They were all discarded in favor of a maxim which was favored by the Mrs. Shipley's father, Murray. Fortiter in re, lenitaire in modo. Courage for the deed, grace for the doing. The first head of the French department was Mademoiselle Josephine Arnolette, who started the traditions of French tables in the dining room, French clubs, and French plays. A 1919 graduate wrote a vignette for the school's 50th anniversary that I thought was worth sharing. It was on Armistice Day that this dauntless woman of voluminous underskirts and layers of sweaters came into her own. Usually tractable, we broke loose on that early morning of November 11th when the clanging bells and piercing whistles gave out the news, the end of the war. We streamed from our rooms into the corridors. Even Miss Litchfield's refined but iron discipline failed to hold. We swept past her into the gym, a half-hysterical stream of youngsters. And then, at the first streak of light, we formed a double column, and with Miss Agnolette brandishing the stars and stripes, we marched around the hockey field singing the Marseillaise. The physical growth of the school was remarkable going from six students and nine faculty in 1894 to 70 students and 20 teachers just nine years later. By 1913, there were 39 teachers, a resident nurse, a school physician, and 75 boarding students alone, plus the day students. The school ran from early October to the end of May. I wish I could tell you more about the personal lives of the Shipley sisters. I can tell you virtually nothing. None of them ever married, and except for Hannah's relationship with Rose Chamberlain, none apparently had a long-time companion. Even the 75th anniversary book for the school revealed no secrets, 
and the local newspapers never reported more than their school activities. In 1916, Hannah, now 64, decided that the sisters had carried the school as long as they could, and Alice Howland, the Shipley's niece from that willful sister Mary who had married against their father's wishes, was ready to take over. Alice had attended Shipley as a senior in 1900, Bryn Mawr College in 1901-02, but ill health prevented her from finishing there. When she was 22, she spent a year at her aunt's school as their assistant, and at age 28, she returned, this time to specifically be groomed to take over upon their retirement. In the interim years, she had formed a close relationship with Eleanor Brownell, seven years her senior, a Bryn Mawr graduate of the class of 1897. Howland and Brownell had spent five years as joint principals of the new school in Utica, New York, and they came to Shipley as a twosome in 1911. After five years of assimilating the school as assistant principals, they purchased the school from the Aunt Shipley's, the property for $150,000, the goodwill and fixtures for $50,500. Miss Brownell oversaw the upper school, Miss Howland the lower school, but they worked so closely as a team that their students started calling them the Hownells. They purchased a small old-fashioned farmhouse several miles from Bryn Mawr, which served as their home for many years, and they commuted from Gladwin in a long green Franklin touring car. When the auto came careening onto campus at 8 a.m., the whole school snapped too. The Hownells allowed the girls to hold a yearly picnic on their property, and they invited seniors for a special weekend but there was no question that the farmhouse was theirs. The Hownells then shocked everyone by adopting two babies. Sylvia Ann arrived first, and she was announced at the annual Christmas dinner with the whole school assembled in gala array. I well remember the split second of awestruck absolute silence which preceded the wild and thunderous burst of applause. The second baby, Mary, arrived six months later. Like so many of the things the Hownells did, this was a joint enterprise, and they gave the children the surname Shipley, so that there could be no question of mine or thine. The Shipley sisters died within three years of one another, Elizabeth and Catherine in 1929, Hannah in 1932. They were buried in the Belmont section of Laurel Hill West, just a few feet behind a mausoleum that's designed by the Lewis Comfort Tiffany studio, and about the same distance from bubblegum magnet Frank Fleer. Hannah's estate of more than $189,000 included bequests to, quote, keep alive the knowledge and influence of Quakerism on education, end quote. Bryn Mawr College received $10,000. The Children's House of Cincinnati, founded by their father, received $5,000. And $10,000 was provided for a monument at Laurel Hill West for her two sisters and herself. I visited the stone on the mooring that I wrote this. It lists the three sisters side by side chronologically. There's a lantern in the center of the stone. What's noticeable is the granite is immaculate, and this is March. There's not a speck of lichen or dirt on it. And knowing Shipley, as I do after studying it for this podcast, I suspect that girls from Shipley make the trip from Bryn Mawr to be sure it stays that way. Now, before I close, I want to mention two Shipley instructors who are interred at Laurel Hill. Catherine Mary Lees, L-E-Y-S, 1898-1951. She was educated at Lady Margaret Hall of Oxford and in the graduate schools of Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania. She joined the English department at Shipley in 1929 and became a dean of students in 1945. She was described as a quietly beautiful, dignified gentlewoman with an unusually lovely speaking voice and a deft, dry wit. The girls loved her both as a teacher and for her Christmas dinner monologues, 
where she was known as a sophisticated and penetrating comedian who knew no peer. Sadly, she died of cancer at age 53. She's buried at Laurel Hill West in the Plymouth section. The last Shipley person I want to mention was a surprise, because she is buried in a plot at Laurel Hill East that I have returned to time and again, one that was purchased in 1839 and is still active. Catherine, with a C, Bolin, B-O-H-L-E-N. She was born in 1904, the same year as her first cousin, Charles Chip Bolin, U.S. Ambassador Extraordinaire, who was FDR's personal Russian interpreter at Yalta and Potsdam, and who is one of the six wise men, written about by Walter Jacobson in his excellent book. I highly recommend it. The book is the same name, The Wise Men. Catherine Bolin wrote a self-deprecating mini-biography for the school's 75th anniversary book. I'll let her tell her own story, but I have abridged it. Half a century ago, I was an educationally deprived child who had missed nine years of school disciplines, comradeship, and competition. I was just teaching myself painfully to read and write English and was wholly ignorant of such subjects as Latin, science, and mathematics, and I have, alas, remained so. I was taken to Europe for six years, and by the time we settled in a house, I was nine, a stubborn, rebellious child. So it was thought best not to send me to school. A French-Swiss governess lived with us, and I thought I was fond of her, and made many resolutions to reform. The morning sessions usually ended in a tantrum, books tossed to the floor. I rebelled against learning poems about the naughty Petit Pole, but enjoyed such lugubrious recitations as Victor Hugo's La Conscience. The remainder of Mademoiselle's repertoire, botany, arithmetic, Swiss history, geography, I rejected with scorn. When I was 13, Mademoiselle went home on vacation and died in an epidemic of virulent grip. I was very sad and lonely. I decided to teach myself to read English. I selected the novels of Charles Dickens, attracted by the Crookshank and Fizz illustrations, and I went straight through them. At about the same time I was preparing for my confirmation, having got religion, I had to write a weekly essay based on the catechism, but as I could not write in English, I composed an entire essay in my head and then dictated it to my mother, who then spelled it back to me word by word. After six weeks of this, I really enjoyed writing, although my spelling has always been weak. My deep love of history, the sense of being at home in past ages, began when I was ten. Mr. Stevens, a Cambridge fellow, had come to Switzerland years before for reasons of health. He seemed immensely old. He started my first and last lesson in Latin, and I began to weep and rage. When I announced that I could and would not read or write English, he was too shocked to protest. So twice a week for the next four years, Stevie told me history, a leisurely ramble minutely detailed down the ages in England, then France, Spain, Italy. He read to me from many books, hoping to persuade me to read for myself. Above all were great sheets of paper covered at every lesson with quick, clever drawings to illustrate anything I could not understand. Home at last, just after my 15th birthday, I was sent off to summer camp to learn to live with American contemporaries, and then as a boarder to Springside, where I learned to hate sports, changed roommates four times, and was not allowed to make up any deficiencies. Bolin then tells of moving to Washington, D.C. and discovering a knack for algebra and a love of art history. So the undisciplined child, the tardy drop-in, became an avid student and dedicated teacher. For this also, Mrs. Holton, Holton was an early headmistress, was responsible. She was convinced that despite the gaps in my education, I would make a good teacher. 
Since nothing can shock us today, I will admit that she had influence with the chairman of a department of the University of Pennsylvania. The university was willing to grant a degree if I could supply another credit in mathematics and another foreign language. So during a hot Washington summer, I tutored in geometry and German, presented myself for the examination, and failed both. Mrs. Holton was adamant. Why should they not accept a credit in the history of art? They did, and the drop-in achieved a B.S. and later an M.A., and is taught in three fine schools, and is grateful beyond measure for the vision of a great teacher and headmistress. As a three-time college dropout myself, who attended medical school on pre-med courses from a community college, but who retired as a professor of emergency medicine, I feel a rather strong personal kinship with Catherine Bolin. Shipley School went co-educational in 1972. Boys were accepted in the K-3 through classes. The last boarded students graduated in 1982, and by 1984 there were an equal number of boys and girls in the school. Shipley's current enrollment is more than 800 students from kindergarten through 12th grade. Average class size is 14. The school's endowment as of 2019 was $41 million. The school colors are Carolina Blue and Forest Green, and the school's sports team's nickname is the Gators. The Shipley School, founded by Hannah, Elizabeth, and Catherine, interred at Laurel Hill West, is still considered one of the best college prep schools in the United States. April edition of All Bones Considered Laurel Hill Stories is about white-collar crime. Famed muckraking journalist Lincoln Steffens once described the city of Philadelphia as corrupt but content. Philadelphia industrialist John Edward Charles O'Sullivan Attucks, known as Gas Attucks to nearly everyone, earned a fortune, and then he spent much of it trying to buy a seat in the U.S. Senate. Sam Stars and Stripes Ashbridge went from city coroner to mayor in 1900. When he stepped down four years later, he was generally acknowledged to have been the most corrupt mayor in the city's history, and that reputation has stood. Fellow guide and historian Tom Keels will tell you his story. And then I'll finish off our crooked trio with the story of the brilliant architect Joseph Miller Houston who built the magnificent Capitol building in Harrisburg, but then spent time in prison for graft when the building was completed at three times the cost he had submitted in his initial bid. Biographical Bites from Bala, Laurel Hill West Stories, episode number 19 in mid-April, will talk about the founding of one of Philadelphia's greatest shopping emporia, Strawbridge and Clothier. The company's founders, Justice Strawbridge and Isaac Clothier, are buried just yards from each other at Laurel Hill West. I remind you that there are self-guided tours available for both cemeteries. For Laurel Hill East, download the app. 
or Laurel Hill West, well, you can find that with your podcasts. There's a walkthrough from the Kinwood Trail entrance to the Pencoid exit and another in the opposite direction. If you do the round trip, it's about two hours of stopping at Stones, peeping in mausoleums, and hearing about nearly 100 people who helped to make Philadelphia what it is today. There are lots of tours coming up. You can find out about the tours from our website, laurelhillphl.com slash events. All Bones Considered and Biographical Bites from Bala are researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Lex, retired professor of emergency medicine from Temple University, volunteer tour guide, and podcaster for both cemeteries. You could reach me at joe at joelex.net. Our theme song, Names at Peace, is by local artist James Harrow. Maybe I'll see you on a tour. Stay safe, stay well. The bibliography is up next. I keep forgetting to tell you about the Friends of Laurel Hill. This is an organization that helps support all the activities that we do at the cemeteries. You can buy in at different levels from the Anti-Mortem Society, which is for youngins, people 21 to 40. Uh, That's only $25 a year. And if uh, you're older than 40, if you're more generous, you can get an individual membership for $50 You get $5 off every public program. You get a 10% discount on gift shop merchandise. You get two free members-only podcasts every year. It's really worth it. If you like, if you're a taffophile like I am, join, become a member of the Friends of Laurel Hill, and you get all of these really cool benefits. Go to laurelhillphl.com. And look up in the upper right-hand corner, and there is a rectangle that says Support. Click on Support. It will tell you how to support the friends, and that's also the secret way you get to the gift shop. If you look at the left-hand column down at the bottom, there's a link for the gift shop. I mean, if you ever find another cemetery in the United States, or maybe even in the world, that has a gift shop and two podcasts please let me know. I'd really like to know if somebody else is doing what I'm doing here. Hey, if you're listening to this within a day or two of it being released on March 15th, you still have time, unless the tickets are all sold out. A couple of special tours coming up this weekend. Saturday, March 18th, from 1 until 3 p.m. is a St. Patrick's Day tour with tastes. Yes, you'll get a wee dram of something at the end of the tour at Laurel Hill East, and then the next day, Sunday, March 19th, Wondrous Women of Laurel Hill West, a new tour, a Woman's History Month tour. I am excited about that. I want to hear that, see what they have done. There's a Hotspots tour on Friday, March 24th from 10 until noon, and a Sacred Spaces and Storied Places tour at Laurel Hill West on Saturday, March 25th from 10 until 11.30. And then, on Sunday, March 26th, the Daring Dames of Laurel Hill East, another Women's History Month tour. And you can probably still get a ticket for Flowers for the Philly Sound. It'll be Sunday, March 26th, in the Conservatory at Laurel Hill West, celebrating the soul of Laurel Hill West and some of the musicians buried there, Grover Washington, Billy Paul, Teddy Pendergrass, uh, disc jockeys like High Lit and Jocko Henderson. Learn all about them at a special two-hour presentation. April, another brand new tour at Laurel Hill West, Sunday, April 2nd. Sweet Souls, Laurel Hill West Confectionery Connections. This is going to be so much fun. Linda Blowney has been working on this for months. You're going to learn about candy makers and cough drop makers and ice cream makers. It should be a real treat, a sweet treat. There is a Spring Arbor Tour at Laurel Hill East on Sunday, April 2nd also. That's at 1 p.m. Beautiful blooms. So after walking around west in the morning, 
head over to East in the afternoon and go on a tour with our arborist. Hotspots Tour, Saturday, April 8th, from 10 until 12 at Laurel Hill East. And then the biggie on Saturday, April 15th. Unsinkable to unthinkable, Titanic passengers of Laurel Hill. We're going to start out at Laurel Hill East and discuss the six people interred there who were on the Titanic. Well, there are a couple of cenotaphs, but uh, three people who survived the sinking, one body that was recovered, and then two who did not have their bodies recovered. Uh, That'll be with Laura Lewis, who's been giving this tour for a long time and sells out every year. So please get your ticket for that. And once we've finished at East, we head over to Laurel Hill West. We reconvene, and there are six more people to talk about at Laurel Hill West who are on the Titanic. Plus, Laura always finds interesting people to stick in there with a with a uh, Titanic connection, even if it is not somebody who was on the ship. Russ Dodge gives his Liberty or Death Revolutionary War soldiers of Laurel Hill East on Sunday, April 16th from 1 until 3 p.m. How can you resist that one? There is an apiary and candle workshop at Laurel Hill West for the bees, Sunday, April 16th, from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. You're going to meet the bees at Laurel Hill West. Sacred Spaces and Storied Places, Saturday, April 22nd, from 10 a.m. until 11.30. That is Laurel Hill West, and Joan Zubris is giving that tour. Joan is one of the original guides at Laurel Hill West. She always gives a fun tour. Spring Tree Salon, Sunday, April 23rd, from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Celebrate Earth Day and Arbor Day with a tree tour. It's family-friendly activities. A hot spots tour at Laurel Hill East on Friday, April 28th at 10 a.m. Steve Chihuahua is giving that one. Steve's another experienced guy. Been around for many years. Beardmobile Family Show. Come see the Bearded Ladies Cabaret at Laurel Hill Cemetery, Saturday, April 29th from 2 p.m. until 3.30 p.m. And then next day, I am giving a new tour at Laurel Hill West. I'm really excited about this. Welcome to Franconia, a slice of Philadelphia. I am treating this one section of the cemetery like you would a neighborhood in Philadelphia. You're going to meet musicians, athletes, industrialists, civil rights leaders, a Titanic survivor. They're all just in one section of Laurel Hill. So there's not going to be a lot of walking, but it will be a fun tour. And you're going to see a lot of beautiful stained glass also. That one we're going to leave from the funeral home. So please join me for that, April 30th. 1 until 2.30. That's a Sunday afternoon at Laurel Hill West. Okay, let's get on to the bibliography. You can imagine there were a lot of articles that I used for this. First and foremost is a beautiful little book called Courage for the Deed, Grace for the Doing. It's by Francis Stokes Hextra, H-O-E-K-S-T-R-A, And this was written in celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Shipley School, 1894 to 1970. It was copyright 1970 by the Shipley School. Fun little book. You might find it in the library. I don't know how easily you can find it online. Another book that I found useful was Victorian Education and the Ideal of Womanhood. That's by Joan N. Burston, B-U-R-S-T-Y-N. Routledge Library Editions, Education, 1800 to 1926. This was first published in 1980. I have the 2017 version. That's from Croom Helm, London. As far as articles, we've got the Campaign for Higher Education for Women in 19th Century Boston. That's by Patricia M. King. It's from the Proceedings of the Massachusetts Historical Society, 1981, third series, volume 93, pages 59 to 79. 
Educating Women in America, Sally Schwager, S-C-H-W-A-G-E-R. It's from the magazine Signs, Winter 1987, Volume 12, Number 2, Reconstructing the Academy, pages 333 to 372. That's published by the University of Chicago Press. 120 Years of American Education, a Statistical Report. That is from the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Educational Research and Improvement. The editor is Thomas D. Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, from the Center for Education Studies. And that was published in January 1993. Finally, the Young Ladies Academy of Philadelphia. Authors, Marion B. Savin and Harold J. Abrahams. It's from the History of Education Journal, Winter 1957. Volume 8, number 2, pages 58 to 67. And then there were a few newspaper articles, mostly obituaries, when the sisters died. But uh, the bulk of the information for this podcast came from that book that I told you about. Again, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please contact me, joe at joelex.net. Stay safe, stay well. I hope to see you at the cemetery.